All right, thanks, Seth. Um, yeah, so uh, so I'm Peter, and I I'm a graduate student in Marin Solar Teachers Group, and normally I work on machine learning uh, for physics applications in general. Uh, and condensed matter theory uh, is one of those topics I've always been interested in, and um, and I guess our group is is uh, is in the condensed matter theory uh, section uh, of physics. So so one thing I've been looking into is seeing if machine learning can be useful for condensed matter theory. And there's quite a lot of different directions. So I'm going to try to give uh, a bit of a high level tour of, of a lot of topics. So uh, hopefully it won't be too confusing, but yeah, definitely stop me if you have questions. Uh, I'm going to try to, so in general, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to try to do kind of a better review of machine learning. So I know not, not everyone here probably has seen much of machine learning. Um, and then I'll be talking about a couple different topics that I found interesting. Um, this is definitely no way uh, kind of covers everything that people have tried. It's just things that I've been aware of, uh, just re uh, kind of keeping up with the literature. Um, so yeah, yeah, and definitely like uh, there's probably plenty of other interesting ways to use it. It's just uh, one of those new computational methods that has been developed. And now people are looking for ways where it's useful. Um, so yeah, just first of all, there's a, a in general, uh, machine learning is kind of this broader uh, category of of methods that uh, that actually go back uh, have a very long history, and uh, a lot of classical machine learning techniques, which I'll also be talking about, are actually useful and probably could have been used maybe uh, in the past before even before this the most recent like kind of revolution in deep learning. Uh, it's just that people were maybe less aware of them. And uh, now people are kind of rediscovering them and finding that they can find even classical machine learning methods useful in uh, for applications in, in condensed matter theory. And then deep learning, I guess, is kind of the new hot topic. It's also probably the least un well understood, but uh, very probably the most empirical part of machine learning where people these days are are taking things like neural networks and putting them in all sorts of combinations. And they're developing kind of like an empirical uh, understanding of how to use them. But uh, the theory there is really still lacking. Um, but there already can be useful things. I think in, in a lot of ways, they can already be useful for us. Uh, so just very briefly, if you haven't seen pictures like this before, uh, you know, in the past uh, several years, uh, there's been generally a revolution in deep learning. And there's a lot of new things that uh, people have been able to do, and especially in the areas of like, uh, in this case is computer vision. Uh, you've probably seen these kind of pictures where where you can have a, a one of these models segment out an image and, and determine what these different objects are and uh, you probably useful for things like self-driving cars. And there's also this other side where you can, people have been building these generative models, which are models that kind of try to capture the probability distribution of your data. And in this case, if you give it data uh, with lots of images, then it'll try to capture the distribution of the image and then sample from it. And in this case, it can produce really high quality samples. So this is kind of the examples of kind of what the state of the art looks like uh, and how good we've gotten at doing this kind of task. Another, uh, I think really um, interesting, yeah. Excuse me, um, I didn't see the image on your slide. Are you sharing? Uh, what? Uh, I'm still looking at the overview page. Oh, is it not working? Hold on. Uh, hold on a sec. So what do you guys see right now? I also am seeing the overview page. I see the oh. title slide. Oh, this is a, that's kind of a weird hold on. Uh, let me see if I can, I think I've had this issue before. Let me exit out and try resharing this. All right, let me try resharing and seeing if see if that helps. Uh, can you see this now? Yeah, I do now. Okay, good. 
yeah, so this is the uh, this is just some pictures uh, of the most recent advances in computer vision. Uh, like I was describing before, on uh, on this side you have these uh, Im image segmentation tasks where you pick out objects and you can label them. And this side you're generating high quality images of uh, from some uh, given some natural image data set. You'll you'll be uh, it's able to kind of capture this distribution of images. So the the next thing uh, I want to talk about is uh, natural language processing, which is another area where. Uh, there's been a lot of advance in machine learning and you've probably kind of personally experienced this if you ever if you've ever realized that google translate is like 20 times better than it was maybe like 10 years ago and and you can see that one of the things that has driven that is the ability to model the distribution of sentences and, and words and languages and even articles in this case it's actually fun because you can give one of these models a, a kind of ridiculous sounding prompt um, for example, in a shocking finding, scientists discover a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was that the fact that the, uni the unicorn spoke perfect English. So you give it this kind of ridiculous prompt, and it can write an entire article based on this prompt that's very coherent, actually. It, it cites an expert, and then it keeps reusing his name and saying, and then he describes things that, you know, sound like it came out of some science fiction novel or something. And so, this kind of ability um, uh, has been getting better and better over the last uh, last few years, and uh, and I guess uh, one of the new kind of the state of the art things that people have been doing. This is just for fun a bit. Uh, is that you, you can actually take text now and generate images from text, so you can combine these two. And in this case, for example, you can tell it to draw images uh, of a snail made of a harp, and you get these all these weird looking images, but like uh, vaguely kind of fulfills this prompt. Uh, so it's it's one of those things where it, it's gotten to the point where I think it's already starting to capture these kind of more abstract concepts. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, and obviously I think uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you probably saw that, uh, I, think, I think playing games has been like part of artificial intelligence for a long time, right? And uh, recently it, it uh, for example, the game of Go was one of these games that uh, would be very difficult if you use classical uh, AI methods. And uh, kind of the deep learning revolution helped uh, basically produce this kind of result where now it, the best Go player is, is, uh, is a machine learning model. Um, and probably more relevant for uh, scientists uh, is uh, recently there was uh, an advance. Uh, so these are both deep from DeepMind. Uh, Recently, there was an advance in protein structure prediction, which is this kind of complicated problem where you have some amino, you give, uh, you're given some amino acid sequence, and then you're supposed to predict what is the shape of this complicated folded protein. And it turns out um, that uh, you can build a machine learning model that does way better than any other, uh, for example, uh, I mean, in the past people have done things like uh, try to actually physically simulate this kind of thing. Um, and, and it turns out the best way is to just directly uh, fit it using a machine learning model. And that's gotten basically close, it's, been, it's gotten good enough that it's now useful, I think, uh, to people. And that's why they, the claim is that they solved this problem. So I guess the big question here is like, are any of these techniques that have, have uh, resulted in all these great successes in the machine learning world, are they useful for our own research? Are they useful in condensed matter physics? And hopefully I can convince you that the, the answer is yes. Uh, although I think a lot of the studies in this area are very preliminary. There hasn't been like any major breakthrough in condensed matter physics due to machine learning, but I do think there's a lot of interesting directions that people are probing. Uh, so uh, so yeah, but so I guess before I go, I can ask if anyone has any questions about this. Uh, and I guess in the next section, I'll try to give you an, uh, a more detailed overview of some of the techniques that uh, will kind of come up in the later applications. So that way you kind of have an idea of what's going on, but I'll also maybe try to remind you a little bit when we're talking about the, ap the applications as well. So uh, the first kind of major category distinction, I think uh, that we can make in machine learning is this distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning. So, so uh, th these are, they sometimes will share methods, but uh, in some sense, they are kind of two different ways of 
uh, approaching a problem. And in one sense, the supervised learning problem is where you you know what your uh, you have some set of inputs and you know what outputs you want to produce or you want to predict. And you give it these input output pairs and you want to fit a function that given some input will produce the correct output. And so the types of things that kind of fall in this category are classification problems where you want to say, uh, given you know pictures of cats and dogs, can I separate all, out all the pictures of cats and all the pictures of dogs? Or maybe more from a physics point of view, if you have two different phases, can I separate out, can, I, can a machine learning model learn to separate um, or learn that there's a distinction between two different phases and learn the, the location of like the phase transition, for example. Uh, and there's all, all, also lots of regression tasks um, that are available in physics uh, where your goal is to just predict some particular quantity given your data. Uh, and on the other side, there's unsupervised learning, which is essentially uh, this idea of taking just your raw data, you don't have any labels on them. You're just trying to figure out, is there some sort of interesting structure or if, is there some structure I'm looking for? And I can uh, use machine learning to identify that structure. So one, one situation I think I've already talked about is when you're doing generative modeling where the goal is really just to capture the probability distribution of the data and then uh, sample from it. So you can produce high quality samples from that are in the same distribution that your data came from. Um, and the other side, there's also, uh, yeah, so in this example here, actually, it, it's showing uh, an example of the second thing, which is clustering. So given, you know, some data, uh, some a bunch of uh, points, and you're looking to say, are there ways to group these points that are reasonable and uh, will give me more information about, give me some understanding about uh, uh, the relationships between these. And so, for example, you could, you could potentially say, oh, there's a, maybe about three groups here, and I can group them by color, for example. And this is kind of what clustering does. Um, and manifold learning is another one of these things where you're looking to fit the, the manifold that, that your data sits on and trying to learn that manifold. So all of these techniques kind of fall under the umbrella of unsupervised learning, where your goal is to kind of just given your data set, try to uncover some underlying structure there. Uh, and yeah, so the first, uh, so the first few methods that I want to talk about are these uh, classical shallow machine learning methods. So these have been around for a long time, but uh, actually, because they're uh, in some sense simpler than these deep learning methods, they're much more interpretable. So I can say exact, I can understand much better what's going on. And because of that, I think a lot of uh, the initial forays into machine learning by physicists They've kind of focused on these because it's very easy to understand uh, to, uh, what your model is actually doing. So in the first case, uh, this is a, in, for support vector machines, uh, they kind of solve this supervised classification problem where your goal is to separate out different groups uh, and classify the, in this case, it's just two different groups. And your goal is to classify uh, in one class or the other. And the way you do that is you just draw a hyperplane in, in your data space and say like everything on this side is belongs to one class and everything on the other side belongs to the other class. And uh, so obviously this only really works if your data, uh, if your data is linearly separable, which means that you can, there exists like some plane that, that you can separate them by. Uh, but uh, there are some tricks that to get around this. So if your data isn't linearly separable, you can essentially uh, one one obvious thing you can do is just to perform some transformation on your on your data and then make it linearly separable and then draw your hyperplane. And so this is uh, and there's some more fancy ways to do this using kernel tricks. So so um, it can do nonlinear data, but in kind of a uh, in essentially transforming it into a linear problem. Uh, on the other side here are rest restricted Boltzmann machines, which are these, uh, which are generative models. So they fall under this unsupervised learning category. And this actually uh, probably looks very familiar to physicists because uh, essentially what it's doing is uh, defining some uh, ansatz for an energy function. And then this energy function, the, the distribution associated with it is just uh, given by uh, this kind of Boltzmann distribution that we're familiar with. And the goal here is uh, your data kind of corresponds to these visible units, these the Vs, 
And these hidden units are kind of these latent variables. And so if you want to compute what, what's the distribution over your visible units over your actual data, you just uh, integrate out these H's, which is very simple to do uh, because of the structure of this energy function. So you can see that it just has these bias terms here, and then it just has uh, couplings between the visible and the hidden terms. But um, but uh, between the hidden terms and between the visible terms, there's, there's no interaction. So you can see that you can kind of draw this bipartite graph here. And uh, this is the picture people usually look at. And so the idea here is that because it kind of has this very simple structure, you can uh, either integrate out H or integrate out V. And then uh, because of that, you can get all the marginal distributions that you want. And uh, as a result, it's easy to train these and uh, you can fit these to some distribution. And then in the end, you just need to integrate out H and you get the distribution of your data. So what, is there like a classic use case for a restricted Boltzmann machine? I feel, I've, I've heard about the, the linear classifier um, and I, I know about the example, like you have some data within some radius and you do like a coordinate transform uh, that you were talking about, but I, I'm less familiar with the RBM. Yeah, so, I mean, I think they're, they're, they, they're essentially the kind of easiest, uh, I think it, they're essentially designed to be, uh, the goal is to have, uh, I guess in very much inspired by physics uh, is the idea that if you can write down some energy function, then that kind of gives you a, a very flexible, essentially any distribution you want, you can write it like this in this form, right? And so they, but the problem is if you just write on a general energy function, then it's actually very difficult to sample from this, this uh, distribution. People have to, you have to do these complicated MCMC methods, which do work actually, um, but um, it's a, a bit, so essentially this energy function is specially designed to be easy to sample from. And so it, in some sense, this is like, the reason people like these is because it's easy to train these, it's easy to sample from these. And so uh, as a result, if you can fit a distribution to this, then um, it makes your life so much easier. Uh, and there are essentially ways to extend this if you want um, to make it a little more complicated distribution. But in, uh, it turns out, uh, we'll, we'll probably, I'll talk about this a little bit in the future, uh, that in some cases, you know, this is, this is kind of uh, already can do a lot by itself, even without uh, adding anything else to this. A uh, qu question? Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. So, so uh, I'm, I'm curious about how physics and uh, how physical it is. So, uh, Let's say if I don't take this uh, probability to be an exponential of, of this so-called energy, I, I, I use some other form. Will, will it still work or not? Uh, I think the, the key thing here um, is that uh, it's easy to integrate out one of these variables uh, mm -hmm. because uh, you can essentially just factor it out and it's, and it's uh, and you can, uh, and so I think that's kind of the, Thing that makes this easy and makes makes this work. Uh, I'm not sure. It's possible you could probably find an, another way to parameterize it. Um, so that I mean, you, you, the whole field of generative modeling is kind of coming up with different ways of parameterizing like a probability distribution and coming up with uh, or sampling from a distribution, and and then coming up with ways so that you can do it efficiently, right? And so this is kind of one approach to doing that. So in some sense, it's inspired by physics, but um, obviously there are plenty of generative models out there that don't follow this form, right? So this is just um, one, one of these generative models. And I think physicists are particularly drawn to it just because it, it seems like it's something they understand, right? Yeah, thank you, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and then moving, uh, moving on to these, so I guess a lot of the, these modern methods that I was showing you uh, involve deep learning. And so I just wanted to say a little bit about how that works in case um, uh, some of you haven't, uh, aren't familiar with neural networks. So at the most basic, uh, in the most basic situation, you just have uh, one layer of a neural network is really just an affine transformation. So you multiply, uh, so the usual, and then you add some pointwise nonlinearity on top. And so the way it's usually implemented is you multiply by some matrix and then you add on some bias vector and then you apply like a, like a tanch to every individual uh, neuron. And so in this case, uh, the way these diagrams usually are shown is that you have some input, the number of input dimensions and then output dimensions. And this is just showing it going through an affine transformation and then a nonlinearity at the end. So it's kind of a, the, the simplest possible uh, flexible nonlinear function you can come up with. <clears throat> and, and it turns out actually, if you have two layers of, 
of a neural network and then you make it infinite, you have the hidden layers in the middle infinitely wide, then you can prove that it's a universal function approximator. But <clears throat> in some sense, that's not actually useful because because all you know is that if it's infinitely wide, it works as a universal function approximator. It doesn't tell you how efficient it is for approximating certain functions, right? And so, uh, I think the key thing with the neural networks is that the architecture really matters. It matters how you put these together. And, uh, and two kind of innovations that I just want to mention here is uh, for it, these image recognition problems, one of the things that people realize uh, early on is that if you, if, if you just use a general huge matrix here for your, um, then it doesn't work very well because it, it's not really respecting this translation symmetry that, you, that images have. And so what you do is instead of just doing a general matrix multiplication, you, you apply convolution instead. And so convolution is kind of like a very small subset of, of, of a, some general matrix uh, transformation that you can make. And, and it's a transformation that respects this translation symmetry for images. And so it's, they realized that I'll just replace all my layers instead of having this dense or the people call it like a dense or a linear layer, they, they'll replace it this, this with a convolution instead. And then you can just stack all these convolutional layers together. And this is just one of the architectures, for example, that people have used, that people are using right now for uh, these image recognition problems. And the, this works really well. And um, kind of the intuition here is that the convolutions really capture something important, in this case, kind of the symmetry of, of this uh, image. On the other hand, actually, there are these attention mechanisms that that kind of shown here that are used a lot in uh, natural language processing, and and these actually differ quite a bit from the standard neural network. But the idea here is that you're trying to, uh, instead of just looking at these simple linear transformations, you actually uh, construct a bunch of vectors corresponding to your uh, your your different inputs, and then do dot products between them to determine how close or how far away. Uh, these vectors are, and then uh, use that as kind of a score function to determine which of these inputs am I going to pay attention to. So that's kind of the very high level overview of, of these two techniques. Um, I think we're probably going to talk less about this uh, attention idea, but uh, these convolutions uh, certainly come up a lot because there's plenty of instances in physics where we have uh, things like that have these kind of translation symmetries, right? Uh, yeah, any questions about this? So, uh, so I guess the, the next kind of interesting development of, of neural networks, I think that's most relevant for physicists is this idea that I was talking about with convolutions of kind of being equivariant and respecting some, some certain types of symmetries. And uh, just like in the case of convolutions, they found out if you plug in those convolutions instead of a, a general matrix multiplication, it works way better on images. Um, I think you know, for a lot of physics data sets, we, Kind of already know there's a lot of symmetry involved and we already know what those symmetries are and the goal is then to you don't want to just plug in a complete general neural network for your problem you want to somehow involve your symmetries in your in your neural network in the architecture so that you don't you're not relearning things and, it, and it's easier to learn um, if it's already built in then you also can use much less data so kind of some examples here is like rotation symmetries you can can build those into your convolution. So you get a rotation uh, equivariant convolution. Um, and another one, these are kind of more recent work where you have, um, in this case, the, the idea is to have, you have some data that's like, like a point cloud, like maybe the positions of a bunch of atoms. And then your goal is to learn some function on these atoms, uh, some properties of this material, for example. And, and then when you're actually constructing your model, what you want it to be is, invariant to translations and also SO3 rotations, right? So this full symmetry group of this point cloud. And so you can, uh, if the actual details of this actually go into, you just look at the representation theory of SO3, which is something that physicists are very familiar with. And so uh, people, I feel like in machine learning have kind of somewhat rediscovered this idea that if you use representation theory uh, and you know the symmetries, then you can do a lot with that. Right, and so they've built these networks that essentially, a lot of them are for physics problems, but you can imagine it, it can be useful outside of physics as well, uh, where you're, you're using the representation theory of your symmetry group and then enforcing that, that your network has to only, uh, that you basically enforcing that your network transforms properly under these symmetries. And uh, another example is, I'll be talking about, yeah. Is, is there a danger? So if you build your network with a certain type of symmetry and like you're studying a phase transition, which may involve breaking that symmetry, is there, do, do you have to, 
explicitly allow for the breaking of that symmetry if you're studying? Or, yeah, or will, so, will the network learn? Uh, so yeah, and, and I guess uh, the, I guess the short answer is if, yeah, if you're, if part of your data does not respect the symmetry, then your network will not do well because it doesn't have this, uh, this uh, property. But I will say that for like things like, uh, at least in, for example, in the simple case when you have like uh, an icing model or something where you have this uh, broken symmetry, uh, if you're looking at it from a distributional standpoint, um, it can also learn, for example, the distribution that's just, uh, uh, it, it, it can just learn like essentially the both degenerate ground states in the distribution. And so it still respects overall, it still it. respects Got the it. symmetry. Um, so that kind of still works out for, for these types of models. Um, yeah. And then the, that kind of the final one I wanted to mention that I'll talk about a little bit more about later is there have been people that have tried to use neural networks to model uh, electron wave functions. And so one important property obviously is that you need the, when you exchange two electrons, you need the, to be an ant, has to be anti-symmetric, right? And so um, there's essentially, you have to build this anti-symmetric symmetry into your neural network. So that's kind of a, a, a kind of neat uh, application of these types of uh, equivariant neural networks. Okay, so, and then the final thing before we get into this, uh, the, the applications is I want to just talk a little bit about deep generative models. So th this is a lot of different uh, models up here that I put up, but I just want to mention them. And then if we talk about them later, I'll probably go over it a bit more because um, if you haven't seen this, it, it's like a, it seems like a, a, a lot of, a lot of complicated pieces. Uh, the, I'll, I'll probably skip the first one because uh, uh, it's not really relevant to any of the applications I'm going to talk about. Uh, but just know that this is the one that currently has the state of the art in the best quality image, image generation. So the, the kind of models that, um, that we've kind of seen before, uh, so one of them is like these energy-based models, which you've seen in, in these RBMs kind of count as one of these, um, where you define some sort of energy function, and then that kind of gives you the probability distribution. So the nice thing about these is you can get the exact, uh, or you can get like not the exact probability, but you can get uh, something proportional to the, 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 the weight of the probability uh, if you have the energy, right? Um, obviously, usually the Z is hard to actually compute in practice, but um, but the idea here is that you have, uh, so you just define this energy function. It could be like an RBM where it's, where it's kind of a simple form. It could be a complicated neural network in which case sampling becomes really hard, right? So this is kind of one approach. Um, another approach, uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here, uh, are called variational autoencoders. And the idea here is that um, you have some latent space which samples, which essentially are samples from a very simple distribution. And in this case, usually they, they, you just pick these Zs to be uh, some independent Gaussians. So you sample from independent Gaussians here. And the idea is what you want in the end to happen is that when you sample from independent Gaussians in this, in this latent, uh, latent space, you pass it through this complicated decoder, you get samples from your data set. Um, and the way you actually ensure that to work is you actually have another network that it's an encoder so you take your data set, you pass it through an encoder, and it encodes it in this samples in this Z latent space, and then it, uh, you decode it back into X, and then you can compare to see if your decoded uh, variables compare the decoded uh, looks like the uh, original data that you put in. And so that's kind of how you would train something like this. And the, in the end, the idea is once you train this, you have now this side of the uh, system is now a a a very efficient sampler of your distribution. So you can just sample random uh, Gaussian noise essentially here, and then you get out uh, samples from your distribution here. And the kind of nice thing here is that actually, it, if you, in, in this autoencoder idea is that you're, you're taking this original space and you're squeezing it down to a lower dimensional space. So the Z is usually much lower dimensional than, than X is. And here the idea is that you're kind of hopefully capturing important generative factors that are independent and, um, and in this case, uh, hopefully maybe even interpretable. So that's kind of the hope here. Uh, and there's no real guarantee of that, but um, in practice, in some cases, you can see, you can kind of see that uh, play out where these latent factors that you get uh, after you train the whole thing uh, look interpretable and you can actually go back and figure out what they are. Uh, and finally, uh, yeah, another related version of this is uh, this, these flow-based or normalizing flow uh, models, 
where it looks actually a lot like this VAE. So it actually, um, uh, in, you might be you might suspect that they're very similar, but uh, I think the big thing here is that this encoder and this decoder are not just uh, arbitrary networks, but they're actually invertible functions. So you have to enforce that they're invertible. And the nice thing about that is then you can actually get um, the dis if you know that Z follows from some nice Gaussian distribution and you know the exact invertible function that maps Z to X, then you can get the distribution on X very easily just by you know computing what the Jacobian of this transformation is. And um, so it actually makes sampling and both computing with the probability is uh, very uh, efficient. So, uh, and, uh, and then finally, I, I think the last one I wanna talk about is, are these autoregressive flows. So this is a lot and I'll probably, when I get to the particular application, I'll probably go over it again. Uh, but these autoregressive flows, the idea here is that you're, uh, you're, you actually sample, they also have the similar property as these flow models where it's easy to sample from them. And it's also easy to compute the exact probability. So in this case, the exact probability is just this nice factored form here uh, where you just decompose it in this particular way. But uh, the nice thing about this form is that when you're sampling, it's easy because you can first, you take the first, so these are just the different components of your vector X. And you can first sample the first one, and then you sample this uh, x1 given you already know x0, and you sample x2 given x1, x0. So kind of in this sequential way, you can sample, you can generate a sample from this distribution. Um, and so this will just come up in one one of the applications. So I so wanted to mention it real quick here. Yeah. Any questions about this? Uh, and then I'll start talking about some of the applications. All right. So. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to go over is uh, this idea of, uh, can we use machine learning to identify phase transitions? And so this is kind of an interesting topic because uh, I think in the past, physicists have kind of come up with lots of heuristic ways of determining whether there's a phase transition. And there's, uh, and there's a lot of like, you know, this is just the, the kind of, uh, there's also the classic Landau theory, right, of phase transitions. And uh, this idea for second order phase transition, you just see kind of like the susceptibility diverge um, and the idea that there exists some sort of order parameter. Um, but the, the idea is always kind of start with finding an order parameter. And so kind of you have to be smart enough to figure out what the order parameter is before you can apply any of this, this theory. And so in some sense, uh, one task for machine learning is, uh, it might be to discover maybe the order parameter. And the other, another task is to even determine whether there exists a phase transition at all, um, which is, uh, is certainly a question in some cases that has been unresolved. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is um, if you're given, if you if you give the machine learning model two different phases, can it determine what the order parameter is? Can it determine what the phase transition, where the phase transition is happening? And so this is kind of the, a topic that people have looked into recently. And so one way of doing this um, is using uh, SVMs, which I talked about before. Uh, and uh, the idea for SVMs is you have this kind of decision function, which is just this hyperplane in, in uh, your data space. And so if the decision, this decision function, the sign of this de the decision function kind of tells you which class you're in. So if you're on one side of the hyperplane, it'll have a positive sign. On the other side of the hyperplane, you'll have to be negative. And so and if, if you go through the, so the objective looks like this. And if you, if you actually go through and optimize this, you'll find that actually the optimal hyperplane here is that has a nice simple form. It's just this linear combination. So these YKs and XKs are the original data where XK is like your, your data and YK are the labels, whether it's plus one or minus one in which phase you're in, right? And so the idea here is that and these lambdas are just some some coefficients. So the idea is that W actually is just a nice linear combination of your original data. And so the solution looks like this for, for SVMs. And so it's kind of very much uh, easy to interpret because all you're doing is uh, computing some linear combination of your original data points and that gives you the hyperplane that you want. And uh, the trick is to determine um, how to massage your data in a way so that you end up with a linearly separable data, right? And so, so the way that people generally do this is uh, what you do is you, you wanna, so what, one way to do it is to say, I'll transform my data first and then perform this dot product here, right? But on the, the, another way to do it is to, instead of trying to define this, some complicated transform, you can just define a kernel function that represents this inner product. 
And if you define this kernel function, it's kind of equivalent to defining the individual some transformation on X. Uh, and so kind of the whole whole thing with SVMs is it comes down to how you pick this kernel function or how do you pick this feature so that you get uh, a nice space to classify your, your system. <clears throat> And uh, if you know a lot about your system already, then you can already, you can kind of work out what this kernel should be. And then it works really well because you essentially have given it all the information that it, it needs to be linearly separable in this space. So, so kind of one idea that kind of uh, it was shown in this paper here is that if, uh, if you're looking, if you have some spin model and you're looking for multipolar order in general, um, then, you know, you're, your order parameter is going to be some combination of these these expectation values of spins uh, at, at a particular site, right? And so, if you know that ahead of time, what you can do is just give it a, a bunch of different, uh, basically all possible monomial features, right? Uh, uh, of these expectations of, of spins, and then given that um, you can construct a kernel function. In this case, the one they choose is this dot product between the features, and you square it. And uh, I'll, I'll mention later why it's it's squared. But um, for example, if you take a kernel like this and then you pick some Hamiltonian, in this case, is some classical Hamiltonian that has quadrupolar order, in this case, this Hamiltonian here, uh, then if you go and try to fit this SVM to this, what you'll find is, um, so this is kind of a diagram of uh, this, uh, fitted to fit the, this fitted deci decision function and which terms it's actually picking out. So it actually is very structured here. And actually, if you stare at it long enough, you can work out that this particular pattern, uh, you can decompose it uh, in a way so such that the, the, the decision function looks like this, where this Q is just uh, this term here. And the really nice thing about this is, you know, this Q is really just the, the order parameter for this quadrupolar order. And so, so in a sense, uh, what, what's come out of this is that, so when this Q, for example, is, uh, is in this disordered phase, it's, it's zero. And so in that case, um, the decision function has a certain sign. And when this Q grows large, then what happens is that the decision function will flip sign. And so then, the, then you'll get, uh, so then you can kind of see how if, if your order parameter is incorporated into your, your decision function in this way, then you can get a really nice classification because in one case, it, it basically classifies everything that's near zero and everything that's far away from zero. And so this is kind of an example of uh, where a case where if you know ahead of time, kind of the general form of your, of your order parameter, then SVMs work really well because you can just plug in what that form is and then it'll just work out what the coefficients should be. Um, yeah, any questions about this, uh, this particular topic? Uh, this side over here is really just uh, showing uh, different ways of training. So you can uh, basically, I think the most important thing here is to, is to point out this in, in this, uh, this particular way where you take samples from deep within the, the phase itself actually works really well. So you don't even need samples near the phase transition, but it can determine this order parameter and it can determine um, the, it can determine very accurately uh, this particular, this, this classification function just from samples that are deep within each phase. Okay, so uh, I guess, uh, so moving on from that, uh, another way you could possibly do this, right, is to consider uh, fitting, instead of using an SVM, you can use a neural network, for example. Um, and so this is another example where they, they tried this. In this case, this is a, this is a quantum Hamiltonian. And, and they're just taking, uh, I think, so what they're doing is they're giving it Monte Carlo samples from this Hamiltonian. And the, the, the neural network is essentially trained to, to predict whether it's in a particular phase or whether it's in another phase. And so you can, uh, you can make uh, plots like this where it shows that uh, at a certain point, the prediction switches from one phase to the other phase. And in particular, I think the interesting thing here is that they actually train this model. Uh, so you know that there's just two parameters here. There's this kappa and there's G. And they train the model at kappa equals zero. And so what you kind of see is that it, it'll predict that below one, uh, it's in one phase in, in this disordered phase and above one, it's in another phase. And so I, in some sense, it's, it's been trained at kappa equals zero. Uh, but what they're showing here is, it, it, given that it's already trained here, if you give it samples from kappa equals 0.1, it actually predicts really well. It actually 
shows it gets the phase transition point really accurately. And that kind of just tells you that the 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 machine learning model as like a pattern recognition model, right, has already figured out what a certain phase looks like. And so uh, if you give it a different samples from uh, a slightly different samples here in this case, then it'll still do a good job at, at determining what phase, the, given the sample that I'm looking at, what phase is it in. And so uh, it actually does all, all, well, if you look at these uh, yellow points here, it does pretty well at following this uh, phase boundary. Uh, all the way down to uh, when it intersects zero here. But after here, you notice that it just it just kind of has a flat prediction. And uh, that's kind of expected because actually this phase boundary here is for a different phase transition, this BKT transition, right? And so as a result, there's no, it has no experience with that particular phase. And so it, it, there's no reason for it to know that this actually, um, that, that, that phase makes sense. So in some sense, if we are doing these supervised learning methods, they do actually work quite well for distinguishing phases, um, but, and, but they only really work if you know ahead of time, right? That there is, are these two different phases and you tell it what they are. Um, there are actually a couple different methods that kind of go about, can we do this in a more unsupervised way where we don't tell it that there are two phases and see if it can figure out. And uh, some of those methods uh, do kind of work on this, but probably are not uh, super general. Uh, and, and kind of the interesting thing here is how do you build a machine learning model that can automatically tell you if there are two different phases, right? And uh, one kind of approach to doing this is uh, using one of these unsupervised generative models that that I was telling you about. So in this case, it's this VAE model where I mentioned it kind of compresses your data down to some small latent space. And then it uses that latent space to then generate samples from your data. So there is uh, some work a while ago that actually just tried doing this on some, some of these sim simple classical uh, statistical ensembles. And, and the idea here is then, can we look at this latent space? And then given that we look at this latent space, can we, uh, can we see something useful in this latent space? And it turns out if you, for example, give it samples from an icing, a fair amount of icing model, then, uh, and you give it uh, this one latent parameter. So in this case, you're only allowing it, you have to, you're telling it to either squeeze down to like a single latent parameter in this case before decoding. Then what you're looking at here is essentially it's, it's learned uh, a latent parameter that correlates exactly with this magnetization. Um, the thing is that with the icing model, it's actually not that hard to do this. Even PCA can do this, I think. So, so there are these like linear methods that can do this. So it's not super surprising that this works, but it's just kind of a nice proof of concept that you know, it's possible that if we if we try to use these kind of generative models, then hope something like a VAE maybe will have a chance at determining. Uh, so it, it really just is looking at these important generative factors, and in this case, it's determined that knowing what the magnetization is in, is important for when I'm generating samples. And so if you look at the, in this case, you're looking at the distribution at different temperatures, you can kind of very clearly see that it's kind of learned the magnetization and you can uh, see in one case, it's kind of peaked at zero. In the other case, it, it has a much wider uh, range. And they've done similar kind of tasks with the antiferromagnetic icing model and XY model. And so you can see that um, in all these cases, the VAE's latent space kind of captures useful information. And so the hope is that maybe if we look more carefully at Z, then we can we can uh, identify phase transitions, or we can at least identify what are like the important factors in, in generating these samples. Um, so I think these all this work is, um, so I, I will say that, so as far as uh, this uh, identifying phase transitions thing, I think um, the SVMs are certainly, I think the most successful in the sense that if you already have, in a lot of cases, when you're dealing with the system, you already have a reasonable idea of what an order parameter should be. Um, then if you're just trying to find out what that is and fit it, then SVMs work really well because you can just write down you know, all the possible terms that, that could be the, the order parameter and I'll figure out what, what that order parameter is. Um, but in these other cases, I think it's, it's less obvious that, that this kind of method will work in general. Um, but it's definitely, I think on, if you can, I think the key here is structuring your network so that um, that what you're getting out of it is something that you kind of can interpret. And I think uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later in a different context. But but um, I do think that a lot of the architecture design that goes into these networks is going to be really important if you want to if you want to have to hope that 
eventually that you can get useful interpretable information out of this. Yeah, so any questions about this uh, uh, phase transition identification? Uh, I'm, I'll probably, I think, yeah, so I'll be probably moving on to a different topic after this. All right, so the next thing I wanna uh, talk about is this uh, problem of uh, improving sampling uh, from known distribution. So this is kind of a very common problem that uh, you, you actually find in, uh, in a lot of physics applications. A lot of times we know what the distribution should be, or at least we know what the probability weight of the distribution should be, and, but we're trying to sample from it. And the kind of the classical way to do this is to do some sort of MCMC uh, Markov chain sampling. And this, you know, in, in theory will work, uh, but in some cases it, it's very slow. Right, and so the hope is to speed that up. So there's been a couple of different uh, areas where actually machine learning is kind of just acting as a tool here to help speed up these, these kind of calculations. Um, but the way they do it is interesting because essentially what they have to do is learn the distribution that you're trying to sample from. And in that case, it actually gives you a really nice model where maybe now you have a model that, that very closely matches the correct distribution. And so one area where uh, this has been done is to use these normalizing flow models that I mentioned before. So the idea here is you have this machine learning model that's invertible and so you can go, you can either go from uh, your data space to some uh, latent space with simple Gaussian distributions or you can go the other way because these are just invertible transformations. And so the idea is that after you train this whole thing, what happens is you can just sample simple um, from simple Gaussian distributions and transform it into your data space. Now, this this will be just be the learned distribution from the model, but in a lot of cases that's really not good enough because if the distribution that you learn has some bias or is slightly different from your true distribution, then you know that messes up your calculations. So, so there's actually a nice trick that you can do is once you have good samples, uh, reasonably good samples, you can then just reweight them based on because remember this is in the case where you already know what the maybe you already know what the energy should be, or you already know what the probability distribution, what the weight, the probability weight should be. And so given that you already know the energy, so in a lot of cases, for example, in physical systems, we can easily compute the energy, but the distribution is really hard, right? And so if you generate a model that at least closely fits the distribution, then all you have to do is rewrite the samples and you get a unbiased estimate of your, of your distribution, unbiased, uh, and then you can compute unbiased uh, estimates um, of expectation values, for example, from your distribution that, that you're looking for. So this is kind of a very powerful method where the, it, it'll speed up this whole sampling process by a lot. And uh, let me see. Yeah, so this is kind of just a simple example where they just took, uh, in this case, there's these two particles here that are connect that are supposed to act like a dimer. And it, that they just have, there's some, so there's some like force in between them and, and there's some uh, free energy surface corresponding to this dimer, but there's a bunch of these solvent molecules around that, that kind of, uh, that change the shape of the surface, right? And so this could be a very complicated distribution. And so the idea here is just to show that if you use this sampling method and learn the distribution here, what you're getting is, uh, what, what, what you can do is, uh, so this, this black distribution is the true distribution from the MD calculations. And this blue distribution here, here is the distribution learned by the model. And you can see, so it doesn't match exactly here, but what's going on is um, even if it doesn't match exactly what you do is then you take samples from it and you can just reweight them based on the, what the, distribu the true distribution is. So if you already know the energy, for example, and in this case you can get exact samples from this. And then you can, the plot here is just showing that, that these green dots, which are uh, represent the, compu are computed from the samples of the distribution kind of give you exactly what the free energy is at different temperatures. And so this is kind of a, really powerful way of speeding up sampling uh, when you're working with these types of, uh, you're trying to sample from these distributions. And I just wanted to, um, so yeah, and then, so yeah, so real, real quick, uh, are there any questions about this particular method that I described? So I wanted to point out that actually over in, in the, uh, over in high energy physics, people have been doing the same thing. And and in particular for lattice QCD, they have these really complicated distributions they're trying to sample from. And so they've, come, they've started coming up with uh, methods that follow this exact format where they're saying, I'll learn some 
I'll use a machine learning model uh, to learn this distribution. And then given that, I can then take these samples and then reweight them or put them in a new Markov chain uh, or do, I can do whatever I want with these new, new distribution of samples. And then uh, this should be much faster than doing um, even, uh, uh, even like the, these more fancy uh, Markov chain methods. And in particular, I think they're interested in this case where you have this critical slowing down when you're, and so uh, you'll see that in the case of, you know, if you have local metropolis updates, or even if you have Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, it'll eventually start having this exponential behavior as you go to bigger and bigger systems. And for machine learning, if you learn the system using a machine learning model, it just doesn't have this feature. It essentially has learned the right distribution well enough that you can avoid this, this problem. And actually some recent work that they did is they improved this even further by saying, you know, they have these complicated, um, they have these complicated uh, uh, distributions they're trying to fit, but these distributions also have a lot of symmetry, right? There, there are these gauge symmetries. There's all these things that, that, um, that the model, just a plain machine learning model wouldn't know about. So, so what they do is they actually build in these symmetries using this, um, uh, in the same method as these equivariant neural networks that I was talking about before. And once you build in these the symmetries, you can you can uh, you make fitting the model on on your data much easier, and also you can work with much less data. And given this, they actually even improved their previous result. Now you can see that um, that it works much much better than any of these other sampling methods, uh, like orders of magnitude faster. And so this is kind of um, and and I think even uh, even with the training, so, so in some sense you have to generate, you have to actually train these models as well. But I think even with the training cost included, uh, these models still outperform by orders of magnitude the just traditional sampling methods. So this is kind of an exciting area where if you have like um, some physics uh, probability distribution that you're trying to sample from, this is kind of a really powerful way to not only assure you get exact samples, but um, you do it much faster and also I think there's also interest in the fact that these models actually are capturing some of the physics of the system because they're doing so well in this case. So the question is, can you maybe we can peek inside and see see what they've come up with. Um, so that's kind of the the area here where, where I think is is very promising. Although you could probably say this is probably more of a, a kind of a a tool instead of learning the physics. Maybe we're, you're just learning a way to sample better. But in some sense the way these models work is that they have to learn the model, them, the underlying, they probably have to learn something about the underlying distribution that's useful. And so, so, um, so I think in some sense, there's hope that these models are capturing something that maybe we can later go back and, and look at. But obviously this use case is already very uh, compelling just because it's so much faster. All right, so, uh, so the next topic that I wanna touch on is, uh, I think Seth uh, mentioned that there is interest in, in a renormalization group or real space renormalization, especially after the, the Tensor Network talk that we had. And so uh, I just wanted to mention some, so I think the machine learning methods in this area have tended to focus on um, classical uh, renormalization, but um, still I think it's an interesting topic because uh, there are plenty of examples. So when you're doing momentum space renormalization, it's very obvious what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to just integrate out these uh, short wavelengths. Um, that actually doing that is hard, right? But at least we know that that's the right procedure. Um, but for real space renormalization, it's not as obvious. How do you come up with a procedure that actually works, right? And there's this classical Kadanoff uh, block spins, right, where you do some maybe like majority rule or or something like that, and and try to and try to do real space renormalization. But the actual transformation for more complicated systems is not at all obvious what it should be, right? And so the, and in some sense, what you're, the goal is to really remove these short range uh, correlations between, uh, and then keep long range correlations. And so there's this kind of big concept here that, that this is what we want to do, but how to actually implement it is, is kind of people have, have spent a lot of time just kind of for individual systems trying to figure out what the right way to do them is. And so one area where I think is pretty exciting here is that um, recently people have found that you can actually use, um, in this case, they're using these, these RBMs, these restricted Boltzmann machines to actually determine what the correct RG transformation should be when you're doing real space renormalization. And so the idea here is, uh, so it's a little, it's a little complicated uh, in this diagram, but uh, the idea here is that 
you have, so this is kind of your original space here. And um, this, uh, and this, these, this H here is like your hidden coarse grain degrees of freedom. And so the idea is here is figuring out what the transformation needs to be from these visible, which are, which are corresponds to like your, your actual, uh, your original system and the coarse grain degrees of freedom. And so how to actually do this transformation involves learning, figuring out how to map this, this visible to this hidden, these hidden coarse grain degrees of freedom. So the way they actually do this is uh, they look at the mutual information between these coarse grain degrees of freedom and the environment. And when, when they mean the environment, they're just talking about there's some like they have some buffer region. And then they're talking about all the, the system beyond this buffer region they call some, some environment. And the idea here is if I can maximize the mutual information between these and the environment um, and essentially ignore these, uh, ignore the, the information for, for lo these local correlations, then I can come up with a good renormalization transformation. And so the, the way they do it is um, they basically fit all these distributions using the, uh, these RBMs. And then they, because they have this fitted approximate distributions, they can then go and compute this mutual information. Because in general, mutual information is really hard to compute. But if you have like kind of simple distribution, you have, you have these simple fitted distributions there, uh, then you can actually compute an, an approximation to this mutual information. And so they tried this on a couple different examples. I'll, I'll just show the simplest one here, um, where they actually took, uh, uh, in this case, the 2D icing model. And they found that if you, uh, yeah, if you, if you do this, uh, it actually reproduces this majority rule kind of, uh, uh, so if you have a, in this case, it's a two by two block, it actually reproduces, uh, it picks out the, the spin, uh, the majority that has uh, the majority of, of a particular spin. So, so essentially it's relearned this, this rule that we kind of knew all along, uh, but the, the hope here is that it, it can not only do this, but if you apply it to some more complicated model that where you don't know how to do real, real, real space renormalization, then it'll actually be able to come up with uh, new, uh, new types of rules. And actually I think in their paper, they do apply it to a different model, um, but I wasn't super clear on that one. So I, so I decided to just show you this, this simple example, but just know that they have tried it on some more complicated systems and it does seem to actually work. Um, so I thought this was pretty interesting uh, in kind of having the machine learning model come up with the rules instead of having people kind of by hand try to guess what's a good renormalization transformation. Um, and also kind of a, a, a direct, so it, in this case, a, a direct comparison uh, with, uh, uh, hold on a second, let me, uh, Yeah, so in this situation, um, what you're looking at here is, uh, if you remember from the talk uh, a few weeks ago, uh, you talked about these tensor network systems where they kind of implement real space from renormalization. Uh, but uh, and the interesting thing here is that they they do it on these quantum systems, and the way they do it is they have these uh, they, they have these tensor networks designed to remove local entanglement, right? So so. Um, this concept of, of removing local entanglement, if you map it over to like the cla for classical systems, it, it's kind of uh, the equivalent thing would be to remove these local correlations or remove these local uh, local information essentially. So so kind of mutual information kind of maps onto this this idea of, of entanglement. And so so in here in this case, what what was happened here is they they're kind of inspired by this mirror architecture. And then they built a an architecture that essentially looks exactly like Mara, but instead of these tensor network block, uh, instead of these tensor blocks, um, they replace them with these normalizing flows, which are these, these invertible transformations that I was talking about before. And so the the cool thing here is, this thing is at, at, as a whole is just a, one of these generative models, like I said, that just takes Z's, which are these kind of simple distributions sampled from Gaussians, and then maps them to the data space, right? But the way they actually do it is in a way that um, looks like a renormalization group transformation. And in some sense, you could probably interpret it as that because what, what it's doing is essentially in this direction, it's removing correlations. And then these are just uh, a subset of the, of the 
the z's uh, of these latent variables. So in sense, some sense, these these are supposed to essentially capture the local correlations, and then the and then what you're left with are these more long range correlations. And then at each scale, they just remove uh, they remove the same uh, another set of these latent variables. And it, so it's kind of like if you interpret a mirror like a um, like a quantum circuit, right? So in, in this case, um, and for the case of a mirror, you kind of transform everything to remove uh, entanglement. In this case, you're transforming it to remove mutual information or remove local correlations. And so when you actually do this, you can you can actually take this and see how say like how well does this work on as a generative model? And so if you go and fit it to something like a two D icing model, and you can see that if you're uh, it, a simple test here is just to say. Uh, if you uh, sample from the latent space, how efficient is my Monte Carlo sampling from the latent space compared to the physical space? So if I sample from the latent space, which should be essentially independently distributed, then I get very fast convergence right here. So again, it's one of these cases where I've learned a model that, that is a generative model that allows me to sample really efficiently from my data set. But on top of that, I think the interesting thing here is actually really is learning something like a renormalization transformation at each step. And so maybe there's maybe there's some uh, a question here of uh, whether or not we can actually look inside and work and use the transformations it's learned to, to actually say something about the system. So I think that's also, I think, ongoing uh, work in this area. But it's really interesting that this is kind of inspired by the whole tensor network uh, renormalization and people have kind of ported it over uh, to these for these classical statistical systems, but uh, in the in in this case, they, they're building it out using, using these neural network architectures. Yeah, any any questions about this? All right. So uh, the final thing that I want to talk about is uh, variational quantum Monte Carlo, which uh, is another one of these examples where um, it's a it's it, by itself it's a it's a a problem that. Uh, is very difficult, and it's essentially sol trying to solve this uh, solve for the ground state of some quantum system. And the the method has been around for a long time, uh, but the, and that simple idea is that you just pick a variational wave function and then and then try to minimize this uh, this expectation value of energy, right? And so but usually because these it, it's uh, you know you can't actually compute this exactly, so you do a transformation where you just um, refactor the the uh, basically, you just um, manipulate the, the this expression into a form that looks more like you're sampling from a probability distribution. And so in that case, what, what you're doing is uh, so computing these, which are called local energies. And then uh, the nice thing is the rest of these, the rest of this expression looks like it's just sampling from a distribution. And in fact, you can actually approximate it by just taking samples from this this distribution of, of uh, given by this wave function, and then computing this lo this local energy, and as a result, uh, this gives you a nice estimate of what this uh, expectation value of energy should be. So so the idea here is to use uh, probability with a variational wave function to sample to try to compute, uh, and then you can basically optimize this objective. So you can compute with the wave function and uh, optimize the variational wave function. So traditionally, people have come up with lots of, you know, physics-inspired ways of of parameterizing these wave functions. Um, but I think recently there's some interesting work here where people have essentially taken a lot of different pieces from machine learning and tried to plug it in, because and, and, essentially you can put whatever you want into this variational wave function, but um, uh, it's you you have to be able to figure out a way to optimize it efficiently. And so one way to do this is uh, people have taken restricted Boltzmann machines. And in this case, you have uh, this kind of form that you're familiar with, but they've kind of uh, now, instead of saying it's the, a probability distribution, now you say that this is now just with my uh, on, an onsets for the wave function. And in, in that case, um, and they've actually found this is surprisingly effective. Uh, and there's been a lot of follow-up papers in terms of theory as to like maybe why this is the case, right? But uh, actually, if you see, uh, so in this alpha here is just how many hidden per units you have per visible unit. And so, for example, if you just have maybe four hidden units, uh, for example, in a 1D uh, antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain um, with 80 spins, um, then you can already get really high accuracy that you would probably need a bond dimension of 160 for DMRG to, to match. So this is kind of really impressive because it seems like it's outperforming uh, these like 
DMRG, which is already a very efficient method for these types of calculations. And uh, they even did an example where they're doing, the, in this case, the 2D system, a 10 by 10 square lattice, and they're outperforming the state of the art in like PEPS, at least at the time, I think it was 2016. Um, they're, they're outperforming the state of the art uh, uh, variational wave functions that people have used for this this type of system. So it's really interesting that this kind of very simple adaptation of, of RBMs kind of uh, seem to work really, really well for these these methods. And there's actually been quite a bit of theory behind maybe why this, this is the case. But um, I, I do think that certainly it's not completely understood. And, and people are still looking for ways to, to improve this and maybe find ways to... So one, one issue with these is that it's kind of a one size fits all, right? You can't really put much structure into this system because all it is is each hidden node is connected to every single visible node. So you would think that maybe if you could figure out how to put some more structure into that, then it'll, it should do better, it'd be more efficient. But um, uh, so that's still certainly uh, an ongoing, uh, yeah, ongoing discussion about how to, how to make this better. Um, and, but meanwhile, actually, people have been trying all sorts of things. I mean, once you kind of open this box, uh, then you can think, oh, well, let me try to put, you know, just a plain neural network in and see if I can do do well here. Um, and so people have, uh, you know, there's all sorts of people that have tried things like this. And the idea is just to, you know, in this case, it's just to have this variational wave function be a neural network and then um, have some inputs and output the actual wave function. And in this case, it kind of is similar to what these, these energy-based models where you're just parameterizing some energy function. In this case, you're just parameterizing the wave function. And then um, the tricky bit is how to sample from these. So you have to still use these MCMC sampling methods. Uh, but uh, one interesting thing that people have noticed is that the structure actually does matter. So incorporating things like, you know, if your system should be have some spatial structure, then making it a convolutional neural network instead of a fully connected one actually makes a difference. So in this case, it's just uh, showing that the convolutional neural networks uh, do better than, than fully connected ones in this case. Um, I don't think these are necessarily, so the question is whether that or not something like this would be competitive with you know, existing methods, right? And I think in the case of, uh, I think the place where I think would be most useful are, are in, you know, in 1D, you know, DMRG works really well, I think, um, but beyond 1D, I think there's definitely room for improvement. So that, that's where a lot of interest is in this, in, for these methods. And kind of uh, another related architecture that I, I won't go into too much detail, but people have done the exact same thing, but now using a uh, for arbitrary lattices. So before, right, um, you just if you had like a square lattice, you could maybe do convolutions. But what if you just have some more weird looking lattice? Um, you can. So what they do is, uh, or even like a, a completely amorphous lattice, for example, you could you could imagine. And so the idea here is you could actually there are these new graph convolutional neural networks where they actually perform operations on graphs instead of uh, your normal your normal data. And so if your your data has some graph structure like a lattice like this, then um, you can use these graph neural networks and um, actually get really good results from this. Um, I will say though that this particular work um, has quite they actually I think they do get like essentially state-of-the-art results on um, a fairly large system here. Uh, but they essentially, this is these, uh, I think this is from Google and they actually use like 128 TPUs to do this. So they have a tremendous amount of compute power. And so I think um, you can kind of see like, even if you're using these neural network methods, the sampling actually is a big issue. And so most of this paper is talking about how to actually sample and, and they had to use quite a lot of compute power to do this. Um, so I guess, and going off of that, um, there are, so I had mentioned these autoregressive flows before. And so one nice thing about uh, switching from just parameterizing directly the wave function as some network and you don't worry about how to sample is that, uh, so one, one problem with this is that sampling is hard, but uh, if you actually parameterize your wave function in this autoregressive way, where essentially you're saying, I want to sample, I can sample one site at a time, and then I build up my full sample from one site at a time, then sampling from a wave function that's parameterized like this is much easier. Um, and so if you can build your model so that the wave function has this form, then uh, it turns out you can exactly sample from it directly. And so, so th this is just kind of a simple example, but the, the neat thing here is that you can see that if you're trying to do MCMC -MC sampling from this, you really have trouble capturing. So, so in this icing model in the in uh, in the ordered phase, right, has these two very different uh, 
basically it has like you have two different degenerate ground states that are distinct from each other and, and far away. And so it's hard for MCMC like to, to jump from one to the other uh, because it requires flipping like all the spins. And so in this case, if you direct using this direct sampling, you're basically guaranteed to always get exact samples from this model. And it's very fast and much fast and does much better job than MCMC. And they've shown that, you know, basically you get you get energies from this type of model that are, are comparable to quantum Monte Carlo, which is quite impressive because quantum Monte Carlo basically uh, is uh, probably like the state of the art here because there's lots of work into working out. I think there's, there's lots of work uh, in the past years and working out the correct way to sample properly from quantum Monte Carlo for these spin systems. And uh, this kind of just in somewhat of a naive fashion has kind of matched that uh, just by building a model that's easy to sample from. Um, yeah, and then finally, the last thing I want to mention is something I talked about before is, uh, you know, now that we have all this work in variational wave functions, can you actually make it useful for, for fitting like actual electron wave functions and, uh, and make it useful for things like um, computing real materials or computing, doing quantum chemistry and things like that. And so one way of doing this is essentially uh, you build these networks, and these are two different networks that are from two different groups that essentially have the same idea. You can build these networks where part of the networks the, uh, uh, involve neural networks, and then you can um, construct these determinant blocks uh, where um, the trick here actually is normally um, if you're doing Hartree Fock or something, you'd have like a single particle orbitals and compute the determinant, right? So. Uh, but the nice thing here is what they do instead is uh, there's this backflow idea where instead of using single part of orbitals, you have, um, you have, in this case, you have many body orbitals, uh, and then you compute the determinant. And so in this way, you can like kind of, even when it's in a single determinant, you can put some uh, many body correlations inside. And so the idea here is to parameterize this using a neural network, use the determinant structure, and use the equivariance of this network so that uh, so that it's guaranteed that when you know, you know swap two uh, swap two electrons that you get this this correct anti-symmetry behavior. And actually, you can this particular version of the network um, they've done a lot more than that. They actually included initialization using Hartree Fock because that's a good place to start. And they also included cusp conditions for uh, for example when you're close to close to like a, like a nucleus, then you, you, we kind of know asymptotically what it should look like. And so, so those kinds of things you can kind of put in to this network and you put all of that in, it actually, you produce like this variational wave function that it is very, that is very close to, essentially it's already very close to, to existing methods, but, but you add in the neural network component and all of a sudden it does significantly better. Um, and I think, so this is an, it, just an example where they computed for this molecule. And you can see that, um, so I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, quantum chemistry methods, but there are these uh, high precision uh, coupled cluster methods, which are kind of go beyond like, uh, go beyond the, like Hartree Fock, right? And those are already pretty expensive to compute, um, but you can see that th the precision that you get from uh, these this neural network onsets is, already significantly better than that. And in this case, it's kind of comparable to the experimental measurement. So, so it's, uh, it's already very impressive what these are doing. And that kind of the vision that I've seen uh, when people talk about what the future of these are is that, um, you know, density functional theory is like a very popular method in quantum chemistry. And because it kind of, given the computational cost, it, it, the accuracy that you get from it outperforms basically all these other methods. Right, but when you go want to want to go to higher accuracy, you have to then jump to these comp these expensive coupled cluster, or in this case, like really expensive methods, like configuration interaction, where you you, you just sum together a bunch of these uses. In these methods, you kind of sum together many many of these determinants together, and to get uh, more accurate uh, uh, more accurate many body wave function. And so the hope here is that essentially this will be something like DFT, where it kind of outperforms significantly in accuracy, um, but has like a reduced computational cost compared to these really co complex methods. It's still going to be more expensive than DFT, but it, in some sense, it gives you a, a, a bigger benefit in terms of accuracy. Yeah, so finally, I guess uh, just to conclude, yeah, I went a bit over here, uh, but there are, I think there are many exciting applications for ML and, and condensed matter theory. And I think um, the kind of things that people have learned so far is that, you know, a lot of times physics in physics, we already know 
a lot about our systems. And if that's the case, in many cases, these classical machine learning methods work really well. Because if you already know, for example, what the form of the order parameter should be, then you know it's it's pretty easy to plug it into one of these simple machine learning methods and and get what you want. Um, and this is true for many other of these classical machine learning methods. Where if you know a lot about your system, you know what the correct features are, then then going this route works really well. Deep learning kind of is this new computational tool that is a lot more flexible, but uh, trying to figure out how to interpret it, trying to figure out how to incorporate, um, how to make it so that it's useful and understandable and to you, I think is is the difficult part. And I think is probably why physics uh, physicists are wary of using it because it's it seems like it's kind of a black box. You don't know what's going on. Um, but I think I've, I've shown you a couple examples where uh, essentially you can you can make small adjustments to it and get exact results or get results that are reasonable. Or if you just put it into a variational method, you don't really care necessarily. Uh, uh, you just care that you, you get a, uh, a lower energy, right? And so in this case, um, but even in that case, I think uh, the important thing about that will not only improve the, the accuracy of these methods, but also maybe help you understand what's going on inside is that you want to include your domain knowledge, include things like uh, symmetries, include things like uh, these like cusp conditions and other things that you saw in the, in the previous slide where, where you put a lot of what you already know into the model and then the rest of it is handled by these deep learning methods. But um, it makes it so that you kind of, you, you fully understand what part of your model is being described by these deep learning methods and it makes it much easier to fit uh, when it comes to physics applications. And I guess a final note here is that uh, there's actually some also work going the other way, which is uh, ML is this kind of field, this, and especially deep learning is kind of poorly understood in many cases. And there has been interesting work here where saying, can physics be useful for deep learning? There's actually some connections between, you know, these deep learning models are highly non-convex. So there's some connections between this and maybe like spin glasses, for example, where you have this energy landscape that's, that's very non-convex. Um, actually tensor networks have slowly worked their way into machine learning. So there are people actually using tensor networks for non-physics applications now, which is kind of neat. Um, and also people, there also has some work uh, actually th thinking about, can you actually accelerate machine learning if you had quantum computers? Um, so that those are all kind of like, uh, obviously it's in a stage where it's, it's, it's very unclear, uh, but I think, I think there's definitely a lot of people have kind of looked in all these areas to see if uh, physics can be useful uh, for machine learning applications as well. That that last point gets exactly. I was going to uh, ask that question because Changnin and I were talking uh, before your talk. I think a, maybe two years ago, I read like some article in Quanta magazine, and it was like, oh, can we think of convolutional neural nets as a kind of renormalization? So I was thinking in that other direction, um, but yeah, you you spoke to that with your your spin glass uh, comment. Yeah, I guess people have always kind of like um, looked at convolutional neural networks and said they look a lot like they're doing renormalization. I think mm -hmm. it's not super obvious to me. I think that that it, that's exactly what it's doing. But in, in like Got I guess it. in a in a moral sense that that's kind of, kind of, because the idea is that if, as you go deeper into these networks, the idea is you get more abstract, um, but I'm not sure of that course for, for, for RG, I guess the idea is that you get more coarse grained. Um, and essentially it is something like that, but I think it's not clear that, you know, that that's exactly what's happening, but in a similar sense, I think, but I think, um, but I, I don't think, I, I do think like things like um, this, this kind of mirror inspired architecture really do uh, in this case implement an RG procedure. But um, yeah, convolutions themselves, it's, it's a little bit harder to say, yeah. Any other questions? Cool, if not, uh, thank you, Peter, for this talk. That was really good. Um, usually I will ask people to give me a list of references so I can put them um, on, on the web page with the, the talk, but you had, you included a lot already, so I can. Yeah, I can probably send you or, or post the slides in the, in the group. Yeah, that would be perfect actually, just yeah. the slides uh, since you linked to all your references there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right.
everyone, hope you enjoy your Friday. See you next week.